Okay so we find ourselves in the middle of this pandemic, the economic shutdown in response to said pandemic, the death of George Floyd and the ensuing protests and riots, along with Trump's response. The results have driven us Americans even further apart. In the midst of all this finger-pointing and proposed band-aid solutions, there is an underlying problem that's either at the root or is at least greatly exacerbating these problems. That is, the record level of income inequality along with the levels of poverty this has caused. At the roots of urban violence is the rampant poverty that has left many to not only turn to crime as a means of an income but to also give in to a sense of despair. People inherently realize that the deck is stacked against them, that the rules are rigged, even if they can't name the policies that have led to this sad reality. This is not merely an urban problem. In rural areas, this is manifesting itself in an opioid crisis. This crisis of income inequality is at the root of many other areas of our political divide. This becomes most obvious when we compare the United States to other OECD countries. Our gun violence problem tracks closely to our poverty and income inequality problem. Our substandard educational outcomes lead to endless finger pointing and blaming our educational system. However, when we compare the US to other advanced OECD nations it becomes clear that our educational outcomes track closely with child poverty rates. Likewise, the reason the shutdown is hurting Americans so badly is that most Americans were already one emergency away from bankruptcy. This is, even when the economy was supposedly good when America had allegedly returned to greatness, most Americans were living paycheck to paycheck. As for actually fixing the issue of our rampant inequality, well, we've jettisoned the only candidates who were looking to make huge policy shifts that would reverse 40 years of failed trickle-down economics. 40 years of busting unions and slashing taxes on the wealthy have only funneled all economic gains to the top and left most Americans working harder and harder for a shrinking slice of the pie. Is it any wonder that people are angry, or are even checking out of the system and turning to crime? But make no mistake. While Joe Biden will likely do little to reverse this 40-year trend and will at best, act as a stopgap or maybe even a slight pushback against it, Donald Trump will continue to step on the gas. In 2016 Trump was understandably seen as a possible third way. A break from the two-party establishment. But it's clear at this point that he is simply following the failed trickle-down economics scam. He is simply another empty suit Republican providing tax cuts to the wealthy and corporations and allowing unions to be ground into dust. As a lifelong con man, he has done a brilliant job taking credit for trends he inherited, like the falling unemployment rate, which of course, ended on his watch. Here is the thing. This isn't a video game. We don't get to do a reset. We don't get to respawn. Trump's tax cuts on the wealthy and corporations have cost us trillions of dollars. We don't get that money back merely by voting him out. We are in the hole. And if we vote for him again, rest assured, he will put us further in the hole. This is the Republican game. Slash revenues by cutting taxes for corporations and the wealthy, then claim there's no money for things like Medicare for all, even though Medicare for all costs less than our current system, and the truth is, we don't have to pay for it, we can run budget deficits, which is how Republicans pay for these endless tax cuts for their wealthy donors. The choice is yours America. Do we live to fight another day, or do we just give up and drink arsenic? For a TV, the world is thinking. Let me give you a few things that people may not be aware of. Um, the first is that the middle class society I grew up in did not evolve gradually. You might think that there was a, you know, there was the era of the robber barons and then gradually America turned into the America of, of Ozzie and Harriet, whatever, that it uh, gradually evolved into this middle class society. Uh, that is not what the data or, you know, the, the available stories tell us. What they tell us is, in fact, that as far as we can tell, the Gilded Age lasted right through. 1920s. America, on the eve of the New Deal, was very nearly as unequal as it had been in, in the 1890s. Um, and that the middle class, relatively egalitarian society was created in a very short period of time between the late 1930s and the end of World War II. 
uh, the economic historians called it the Great Compression because the income differences got compressed. And it's, a, it's as important a story about 20th century America as the Great Depression, which we all know about, though it's much less told. And you look at what happened, and it was the Roosevelt administration uh, through a whole set of policies, but all of them equalizing. Much higher tax rates on the wealthy, higher corporate tax rates, uh, a pro-union organizing environment, so you had an explosion in union membership, tripling of, of the share of the workforce, uh, the uh, minimum wage, social security, unemployment insurance, uh, all of these things. And then the process accelerated because during World War II, there were extensive government controls on the economy, which were used in a way that tended to equalize incomes. All this created a middle class society in a period of not more than about seven or eight years. Um, now, you might have thought, well, okay, but you know, those are all artificial, especially the stuff during the war, so it would, you know, it would go away as soon as peacetime return, but it didn't. Turns out that once you create institutions, norms, expectations of a relatively equal society, it tends to persist. So the income distribution, this relatively middle class society that was created uh, by the New Deal persisted for more than a generation after World War II. Um, then it started to come apart, and you see this dramatic increase in inequality not quite as fast as the Great Compression, but at this dramatic increase starting around 1980, which in itself is kind of an interesting date because that's uh, Reagan comes to the White House. Um, and it turns out that the, well, the increase in inequality in the United States is unique to the United States. So other advanced countries have not seen anything like it. Uh, the closest thing you can see to the U.S., uh, uh, to this unequalization um, that's taken place in the United States is in Britain during the Thatcher years which again is itself a little bit revealing. Uh, and uh, nothing remotely, you just look at the charts and we are, you know, we are off the charts in terms of this increase in inequality. And many of the things that we take for granted as, well, this is the way things work in the modern, the late 20th, early 21st century economy, turn out to be special to the US. So one example I like to use is the uh, decline of the union movement. We all know that unions are outmoded and you can't, you know, it's a global competition and all that. Except, well, here's a comparison people don't know. Um, in the 1960s, Canada, that's, you know, the country up there, they, uh, we tend to, uh, they, they almost speak the same language, eh? Um, but anyway, the, uh, in the 1960s, Canada and the United States had roughly the same percentage of their workers in unions, about 30% in both countries. Um, Today, Canada still has almost 30% of its workers in unions. Uh, in the United States, it's down to about 11%, and much less than that, it's, it's it, in the private sector. It's, it's heavily a public sector thing left. So the deunionization was not something that happened because of the global economy, because Canada faces the same global economy we do. It was something that happened here. And how did it happen? Well, when you look into it closely, you discover that it was political, basically, um, uh, Ronald Reagan, uh, above all, though it started before him, uh, declared open season uh, for union busters. Uh, if you, during, the, during the 1980s, about one in every 20 workers who voted for a union was uh, illegally fired. Um, and the reason, um, sure, we're less of an industrial society, but there's no inherent reason why giant service sector companies, you know, the iconic corporation of the 60s was General Motors, the iconic corporation of today is Walmart, there's no inherent reason why those companies should not be unionized. In fact, similar enterprises are in the rest of the world, but because the shift to a service economy took place in a, an environment in which pol politicians, the dominant political forces, said it was okay to bust unions in the way that we had and people had in the 1920s, uh, we, we've had this dra dramatic decline in unionization in the United States. So it is not, um, you know, and that in turn has all kinds of ramifications for the income distribution. So I can talk about it uh, at some length, but, but there's a lot of reason to believe that politics has driven this dramatic increase in inequality. Sure, technology is there, globalization is there, but it's, um, it, it is very largely political. I should say one more thing. There's a, a view on inequality that you hear all the time, which is, well, it's all about the increased demand for skills for education in the modern world economy. You know, and there's no doubt something to that, but if you actually look at the numbers, the huge growth 
in disparities has not been between the college educated and the non-college educated. Uh, yes, people with college degrees have done better than people without, but th most of the increase is among people with a lot of education. Uh, so that uh, most dramatic statistic, uh, high school teachers tend to have postgraduate degrees, um, and uh, so do uh, hedge fund managers. Um, and as we all know, the, the highest, last year the highest paid hedge fund manager in the United States um, made um, an amount equal to the salaries of all 80,000 New York City school teachers for the next three years. So this is, it, it's not education that is driving this. Uh, it, it's, it's, not, it's not that simple.